Today I want to talk with you about crop diversity. Now, before any of you run to the exits and uh, try to escape, let me tell you that crop diversity is something we all know about, and it's, all, it's something that's really important for uh, every one of us on Earth and, of course, for huge future generations. Very few people understand that there are hundreds of thousands of different kinds of rice, for example, or wheat, just as distinct as a beagle from a Great Dane. Only with rice, there are three or 400,000 different kinds, and with dogs, there are only about 400 kinds. Why is this diversity important? Well, it contains all of the options for the future, for the future development of agriculture. And as we know, because uh, we're reading the newspapers every day about rising food cost and, and the, uh, uh, the possibility of famine in many parts of the world, we need to, agriculture needs to improve and to develop uh, in, in ways that uh, produce enough food for, for everyone on Earth. How does agriculture do that? How does agriculture meet the challenges posed by climate change, by water uh, constraints, by energy shortages and high energy prices? How does it meet just the day-to-day -day challenges that, that it faces from pests and diseases and the like? Well, it does that by using, by tapping into this vast amount of diversity, the three or 400,000 different rice varieties, to fashion new varieties of crops that are climate ready and that can produce high yields even with little water and perhaps little fertilizer and other inputs. So this is why it's important to conserve this diversity. It's the most important natural resource on Earth, at least for human beings, and yet it's endangered. We're losing this crop diversity on a daily basis and losing a sort of an antiseptic way of saying it's becoming extinct. And as distinct crop varieties uh, are lost as they become extinct, then we lose any options, any unique genes that, uh, that code for unique characteristics, disease resistance, pest resistance, drought tolerance, for example. So we need to be conserving this diversity if we value the future of agriculture or even human life on Earth. Well, Fortunately, it's re reasonably easy to save a lot of this diversity. It's found in the form of seeds. And if we dry the seeds to the proper uh, moisture content, we reduce the biological activity in them, and then we freeze them. And in this kind of state, many of the seeds can last for hundreds, indeed thousands of years, remain viable, can be taken out and grown and used in plant breeding programs or by farmers. Um, so in other words, we have a huge global problem, but we have, in fact, a solution for that problem. And the solution doesn't involve technology that still has to be invented. It involves technology that you and I have in our kitchen. It's called a freezer. We have a number of seed banks around the world. Um, those of us in the field call them gene banks. That's just a technical term for big freezers. And there are many of them, hundreds of them, in fact, around the world where we're storing different samples, different varieties of our agricultural crops for use in plant breeding programs for the future. But the problem there is that many of these seed banks are located in fairly dangerous parts of the world. Um, you could ask yourself, well, what's not a dangerous part of the world these days? There are cyclones and other natural disasters there are equipment failures and mismanagement. Virtually every uh, seed bank in the world suffers from financial constraints. There are wars, there are civil strife. So in the past years, we've actually lost large collections, lost as in they're extinct, gone, we'll never see them again, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, um, because of the wars there, in the Solomon Islands. Um, the Philippines uh, seed bank was affected by a natural disaster uh, two years ago. Um, this type of, of, um, of danger is, is something that we're facing all the time. And when we began to look at that situation, taking into mind also 9-11, and for those of us who were involved in this, uh, the, the hurricane and, and um, that swept through New Orleans a couple of years ago, we began to realize, well, gosh, you know, we've got this incredibly important and valuable natural resource. What are we doing to really, really ensure that it's safe 
and can be protected and will be with us for future generations, at least as long as we think that agriculture is going to be necessary. So we began to formulate an insurance policy, a plan B, if you will. And a number of us got together and started to design a essentially a seed vault, a backup plan, a fail-safe plan to conserve a copy in the form of seeds of all the unique crop diversity in the world. We wanted to put that facility in a place and we wanted to design it in such a way that it could really operate by itself with little human intervention because the more human intervention, the more things that can go wrong, frankly. So we began working with the Norwegian government designing a facility in Svalbard. Now, if you get out your map or your globe, just go to the top, to the North Pole, and work your way down just a little bit towards northern Norway, and you'll see a group of islands called Svalbard. They're at 78 degrees north. It's pretty cold up there. Um, if you're going to, to uh, journey to this location on Earth, what you'll do is you'll go to northern Norway, um, to a town called Tromsø. You'll already be about 300 miles above the Arctic Circle, and then you'll get on a jet plane and you'll fly another hour and a half north. That's pretty far north. This is an area where you can find polar bears. Um, so it's naturally cold there. And we designed a facility which is essentially a tunnel built straight into a mountain. It goes into the mountain about 130 meters. We calculated the distance so it goes in at the it stops at sort of the coldest part of the mountain, um, which is in permafrost conditions. In other words, at the end of this tunnel, um, you naturally get a fairly constant temperature of about minus four Celsius. And there we built three uh, seed vault rooms. Um, these are our rooms that are about uh, 30 meters long and about 10 meters uh, wide and about five or six meters tall. Um, they're behind airlock doors. There are a number of various kinds of security and protective measures in force. But the main idea is to put something far away from human beings, if you will, and also in a very cold location. So the seeds can be put, each seed sample can be put uh, in this facility in a naturally frozen, frozen area. Each one of the rooms uh, is large enough to house about one and a half million samples. And by the way, that's about as many as we think exist in the world. In other words, we think there are about a million and a half distinct samples or varieties, if you will, of the different crops that can be stored as seed. So there's a lot of redundancy in this facility. We built a facility that's three times as big as we think it really needs to be. Um, on opening day, we moved about a um, quarter of a million, almost a quarter of a million uh, distinct uh, varieties into the facility. Now, the media calls this a doomsday vault. And I suppose, uh, yes, if an asteroid were to hit Earth or we were to have a huge uh, nuclear war on Earth, this would provide some protection. No guarantees, mind you, They're, those don't exist uh, in this lifetime. Um, but it might provide some protection. But that's not really the reason that we constructed the facility. Um, we constructed it because we're losing diversity every day in normal seed bank collections around the world. In other words, every day is doomsday for particular crop varieties. Every day we're experiencing extinction. What the Svalbard Global Seed Vault will do is to provide an insurance policy against that. So here's how it's going to work. Seed banks around the world, for instance, the National Seed Bank in the United States in Fort uh, Collins, Colorado, which just celebrated its 50th anniversary, would be sending shipping seeds to Svalbard near the North Pole. And those seeds would be in boxes. Typically, you'd have four or 500 samples of seeds packed in aluminum foil packages in each box. And those boxes would simply be moved into the, the seed vault inside the mountain. There they can be kept for, for many, many years, um, even in some cases thousands of years, before the seeds would, would lose their viability. So if a normal seed bank, which has deposited seeds in the seed vault, somehow loses their, their own uh, seed samples, um, 
we can then send them back um, the copy that, the, that they had deposited in Svalbard. So in other words, it's going to operate very much like a safety deposit box at, at the bank. Um, Norway, and in conjunction with the uh, Global Crop Diversity Trust, where I work, will be operating this, this seed vault free of charge uh, for the storage of seed samples. And if they're ever needed, we will ship it back um, to, to the rightful owners. This is not going to be a facility where scientists and researchers are walking in and out every day, um, but it will, um, it will function in times of, of loss. Um, that's the idea. And uh, we have put aside an endowment which will enable us to, to operate this facility in perpetuity. Um, in short, what we believe we've done and I, is that we've, we've assembled essentially the nations of the world in a giant cooperative uh, activity to do something incredibly positive, incredibly long-lasting. I can't think of anything uh, that's been done in my lifetime that uh, rivals this in, 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 those, in those ways. The resources up there are going to help us meet the challenges of the future from climate change to energy and water constraints. So we hope you, you'll take a close look at it, perhaps be inspired, find it uh, hopeful. If you want to know more about it, visit our website at www.croptrust.org. And thank you for your time today. Sorry I couldn't be with you.